History Center interviewing Billy Jordan. This is Francis Westbrook. And Mr. Jordan, would you please tell me your date of birth and where you were born? February 15th, 1921, West Point, Mississippi. And where did you grow up? In West Point. And how did you come to enter the service? Well, I was young kid helping a dairy man deliver milk and he was the commander of the National Guard and I told him I wanted to get in the Guards and he said, you're too young to get in. I said, well, you're the commander. I think you can handle it. So he handled it for me. I was about 16 when I got in the National Guard and I stayed in there till uh, 1940 called out to go to Camp Landon, Florida. Well, I just hadn't had quite three years in it. We had to sign up for a year. I mean, I, I liked a little bit of having the three years. And I couldn't go with them unless I had a full year, so they gave me a discharge and I re-enlisted. And three of us stayed with the National Guard for 11 months and then we were put in for a transfer and went to the Air Force. I started out as a mechanic in the Air, on AT-6 airplanes. And one of my buddies went to pilot school, and he came out as a pilot. And uh, when he got overseas, he flew several missions and was shot down and was a prisoner of war. Hmm. The other boy went in as a mechanic, and he stayed in as a mechanic. And after the war, he married a girl out in California, and he's working for an aircraft factory. And they asked him if he'd go into the party that night when he got off from work, and he said no, he thought he'd go home. And they had a car wreck and got killed on the way home. Wow. They had for a night, so. so that's the start of it. And when I got in the Air Force, uh, they sent me to Turner Field, Georgia. That's in Auburn, Georgia. And I was there when Pearl Harbor happened. They sent we was in a picture show in town. They ran us all out back to the base and gave us sticks to judge to regard the airplanes with. We had to walk around the airplane, but, but uh, I found out that they were sending 10 men to Jackson, Mississippi to work on B-25, so I went in and talked to the commanding officer, and he let me be one of them. And I stayed down there a few months, and they sent me to airplane mechanic school at uh, Keysville Field down in Biloxi, Mississippi. And when we got out of there, they sent me to Nashville, Tennessee on B-24s. I got up there and went to the flight chief and he told me, he said, now Gary, he said, if you find out anything about one of these airplanes, you don't know, he said, come see me and we'll go find somebody who knows. Well, he was just hit. He didn't know anything about them either. But anyway, I stayed up there for, I guess, a little over a year. And I told my sister crew chief that I would go 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 in and volunteer to go overseas and all my National Guard friends had been overseas with me and I couldn't go back to West Point and not been overseas. So he said he would go with me. So we went and talked to the commanding officer and he was going to send me to B-52 school out west and come out as second lieutenant flight engineer. But I told him I had to get overseas. So he and I went to uh, Panama City, Florida and went to gunnery school and then they Sent us to Massachusetts and reformed crews and then came back to Savannah, Georgia and flew for a couple of months. And then they sent us to Epic. And that's how I wound up in Epic. And we carried an airplane from Mitchell Field, New York, who won the Barry Italy. And on that plane was 11 cases of tea rations. And uh, we got over everywhere we stopped because other people tried to get our tea rations. Let them have them. When we got over there, we flipped the coin and then listed men got six cases and uh, seven. We had uh, 11 cases and the officers got the rest of them. We had one case more than they did. We had 11 cases, I guess. And uh, we started flying. And the first mission we flew, it wasn't too much to it. We dodged in and out of flight, and I said, Well, this is going to be easy. But the second mission, I got hit in the leg, and I wondered what in the world I'd done over there. I could have been in Nashville crewing a ship. But anyway, I went on and flew 32 missions for the war was over with. Mm -hmm. We made a nice landing at the Tuskegee Airmen Hill one day. We had two engines shot out on one side. We were losing 600 feet a 
the men that we blew our machine gun and flag suit and everything else we had out and we managed to keep our altitude in until we got to that base and we started in to land. And the co-pilot had the wheel shot out of his hand, his fingers were blood and all. And he, uh, we started in, we was coming in a little lower and he gave it all the power on our side. They had a good engine and turned it up like this. I pulled the power off of it. I been in there with the pilot and co-pilot. The pilot said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to have to hit that field out there because we can't go around. And we hit that field out there and rolled about 100 yards and rig turned sideways and skidded. And uh, first man to the airplane was a black chaplain. And we had one boy from South Carolina. He lives in home, Georgia now. He said, if any of you ever go down in the water, tell my family I'll walk trying to get out because I can't swim a lick. And when the plane stopped, he raised the window and bailed out. He thought we was in the water and we were like the kids. It was about 10 foot down there. <laughs> like the kids that pulled up. But we stayed with Tuskegee Airmen for three or four days. And they finally came up there and got us. And C-47 flew us back to our base. We got back to our house. and. Our radio operator didn't fly with us that day, and he had packed all our stuff up, getting ready to send it home to our parents. He didn't know what had happened to us. He couldn't find out what had happened to us. And, but he, he turned out he was the closest friend I had on the plane. He lives in uh, Kentucky now. Uh, uh, I was in Barry Ridley one day, and he came out with stars and stripes. If you had 80 points, you could get out. So I went up to the back to the base and gave the first sergeant that paper. And he run me out of there and said, you're not going anywhere. That don't mean you. And then about three or four weeks later, my three years ran out. I went in there and told him, I said, now next week I'll be a civilian. A civilian is not fighting this war. I still got to run out of the office. And I didn't get to come home like the war was over. And we brought a train home from Barry Hitler. While we were there waiting on a plane, this man, we got a pass and went to Rome and visited Rome about three or four days. We got back and they came up with a plane for us to bring back to the States. And we left Newfoundland going into Massachusetts and we lost the engine and came in on three engines. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, they kept the records of the airplane. They didn't give each number a record of the airplane. I never did get my money for flying home. I said, that's all right, just forget it. I said, I'd rather let the hell that money to get on. And uh, they sent us down to Camp Sheldon and they're sick of some of us. And we ate breakfast about 5 o'clock and Mark marched us up to a big recreation center. Sergeant came out of the back room up in the corner and the first words he said was, Sergeant Jerry, the major wants to see you. I said, my gosh, I hadn't been in an hour and he wants to see me. I went in there and reported, and he said, you got a lot of points, what you want to do? I said, well, I'll take that discharge. He told me to get on the corner there, and he'd have a truck pick me up. And about 10 minutes, the truck picked me up and took me to separation. I went in and got me a bar, made it down, looked between my legs, and the boy on the other side, over there, the one left, and last the guard was up. He got out one day for us. But when I got home, all the boys laughed at me when we signed up for three years for the Air Force. They'd be home in, in just a few months and we'd be gone three years. Well, I met most of them when he came into West Point. I used to go up town in the morning the cafe and sit there and talk to people and all. And I'd see one coming down the street and I'd run out there and hug him. Where you been, boy? How long have you been here? And we had a lot of fun out there with it. But uh, that's about all I guess I know about it. Would you like to tell which of the people you've been able to find or keep up with? Well, I found, we found our pilot the other day. I haven't seen him, but he, all the crew members of enlisted men, I've seen all of them. I had them get together in West Point, Mississippi one time, and all of them came except the four officers. Mm -hmm. Three of them I didn't know where they were. Mm -hmm. And the other one was in uh, New Jersey, uh, Patterson, New Jersey. He was in charge of the housing project up there, and he just couldn't get away to come. But I've seen him a couple of times since then. But, uh, we found the pilot about three or 
four months ago, living down below Savannah, Georgia. He, I asked him, when I talked to him, I asked him if he flew in there after the war, and he said, no, he didn't get inside, but he went into the Army and came out as a lieutenant colonel. Mm. And he said he'd had cancer and all, and he was in bad shape. He says, I have to use a walker. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm just in bad shape. But he got to stay with Flying Cross for us, and we made that grace landing up there at uh, Tuskegee. You've had some wonderful awards. Mm -hmm. We, uh, I found out one of the Tuskegee Airmen lived in Columbus, Mississippi, over there about 18 miles from where I was. Mm -hmm. He was a colonel. Mm -hmm. And I went over and visited with him several times, and he died about two months ago. What was his name? Not you know, I can't remember. A boy that lived, a man lived across the road from him, or maybe a block or two, told me told me about it, mm -hmm. and I went over there soon. And then they had a real old Columbus Air Force base recognizing the Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. and they invited me and another boy that uh, had been in the same Air Force mm -hmm. over in Italy. And we went over there and had a big time talking to them all, because they used to fly escort for us. Yes. And, uh, they had a distinguished career. What were some of your first-hand impressions of the Tuskegee Airmen? Well, they could get escort, but everybody said the reason why they stayed in so close to us is they wanted us to protect them because we had ten machine guns on each plane. But yeah. uh, they did it. We did an interview. And do you remember where you were when the war ended? I was in Spinners over Italy. Mm -hmm. We didn't, my crew, did, I didn't fly any the last couple of months of the war because my crew had to, more missions than anybody else in the squadron. Mm -hmm. And they were flying boys that had just come in over there. Mm -hmm. And I liked three missions of finishing up. I had 32 and you need 35 mm -hmm. But I had two men on the crew that had flown with other crew members were sick or something couldn't fly. Mm -hmm. And they, Blue, and they got that 35, two of them. Mm -hmm. and they came home by boat. I went to group home. Were you able to keep in touch with family, with the male at all? Could you keep in touch with your family when you were overseas? Oh, no. Not when God you were overseas. God bless the They didn't have nothing back here. They had a bus mail. Yes. My grandmother died. What's the most, uh, the strongest memory you have of your time in the service? Well, that mission that we flew and went into Tuskegee Air Force was a pretty good memory because we had to throw everything we had on the Air Force plane that we could get loose to keep our altitude. And we slept with it in that box up there and made out of their mess kits and everything mm -hmm. else for about three days. Mm -hmm. See, but two dead people the whole time I was in that service. The pilot lived, the crew lived down there close to us, so in the back in a tent, he went in to bury his and got some pilot to fly and piggyback on a P 51. And he came down over our base, and instead of coming in long ways, he came across ways and went into a mountain. Mm -hmm. I saw the bodies up at headquarters one day when I was up there. Yeah, I didn't care about seeing them. No. Would you like to hold up that picture and tell us about it? Well, this is a picture of our crew. Well, we never flew the same bomber for two days in a row because they always had holes in them and they had to pack them. But this is my whole crew right here, and every one of us came home from the service. Of course, we got. I think we had three purple hearts on the crew. Yeah. I have located the co-pilot, these two men right here. I have located them. Don't know where they are. But this fellow located the pilot by me, said that he found the, the pilot's name. He died out west.
address somewhere and then his co pilot, he never did find anything on him, but he did when he was checking, trying to find, he found a crew that had a bit of a jerk on it. Mm -hmm. And the man pilot, he found the pilot and he told him that bit of jerk had died. The crew mm -hmm. said he was on my crew and he did. He told him, he said, no, not the bit of jerk I'm looking for because he lives in West Point, Mississippi. But uh, I, of course, I didn't know him because there was a lot of people in those squadrons over there. you like to tell us about your hat? Well, this hat, if you can read it there, it says, it says Maloney across the front of it. My granddaughter was over in Maloney every last year, and she, her husband had a cousin or two over there, and he did, and she saw this Maloney. She said, oh, I've got to get that for granddad because that's where he got hit flying over Maloney. So she sent it to me. I put medals on it. I need another one right here. I mean, it's 10 more missions. And uh, it didn't have Italy on it. But I was over here one day and they took it down to the place and they put Italy on it. But when I washed it, all the letters came off of it. Mm -hmm. but people in West Point won't know what I was doing to advertise baloney. Want to tell us about that? Very nice. And tell us about your scrapbook. Well, I sent the pictures on and the sister fixed it all up. It used to have a picture of an airplane on it, but it just, outside cover was just torn up. And my granddaughter here in Atlanta got this and fixed, fixed it up. She did a real good job on it. I sent all these pictures on mm -hmm. and made it. That's a wonderful members. keepsake. It's just crew members and people, boys that I knew over there and all. And I was really proud of it. She did a good job. Of That's one there was got hit. Wind blew off of it. Didn't see any parachutes come out. Sometimes you can see a couple of parachutes come out when it went down like that, but not often. Anyway, and that's the picture of the stars and stripes that they, we got every week. This fellow here, this plane here, standing on his nose. We don't know what happened, but it's still, he was standing on his nose, and he, uh, the four men in the nose got killed. Mm. And that's a house that we built on the land. Cost a hundred dollars a piece, ten of them. Plus the cigarettes and candy that we would get. That ship blew up in the harbor of Barry Italy when we were in town there one day. And that's just pictures of the crew getting ready to fly and all. And every mission we came back, they had a glass of whiskey for us. I guess I might have been, me and one other boy was on the crew on the crew, we never did drink it. And I said if I had to have whiskey to fly with the missions over, I didn't have to be so wet. I never did drink it. I still don't drink. Mm -hmm. Don't even drink a beer. I got sick off cigarettes when I was about the seventh or third grade of school. I never have been, I was off of Georgia back. I never have been able to chew a smoke either. Thank goodness. Then we went to the Isle of Capri on our rest camp after we flew half our mission. They sent us to a rest camp. Mm -hmm. They sent us to the Isle of Capri. There's a little boat there. That's the town that they put there somewhere. That's the picture of them again, the Purple Heart. That's. Price came over the first mission he flew, he flew the profile of us. That's snow we had over there. That plane came in and tail section all shot up.
Turned out they're good fighters. Well, what effect would you say World War II had on you as a young man? You know, thinking about war in general in the country. Well, between the raising I got from my dad in World War II, I turned out to be a pretty good fellow. Yeah, they just didn't let me get in trouble. If I did, I wish I had What will you want future generations to remember about the sacrifices your generation made? Well, I want them to do something about it now so they won't have to go through what we did. Mm -hmm. I tell you, I don't see how, of course, we didn't have it as bad as the infantry and the Marines and all. But when we got back, we had a good place to sleep and a place to eat and all. And, and the Marines and all, they slept in foxholes and all, and had to eat with mess kits out there in the rain and snow and sleet, whatever it was. Uh, I really feel sorry for anybody in the Marines and, made, and the Marines and uh, uh, the Tell me a little bit about what your daddy how he brought you up? Well, my mother and daddy was a doctor over there. The Chevrolet sure place there in West Park lost the foreman. And he was working for the Brown Buick and Thomas Mississippi, and they were good friends. So the Brown Buick man asked daddy if he'd go to West Park and work them off so they could find him one. He didn't get a he didn't get a shop for him, so daddy stayed the second month. And Stayed there the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. so he married Mama. So, like I said, she was a doctor's daughter. And every once in a while now, somebody asked me, he said, Aren't you Dr. Boyd's son and a friend's son? I said, Yeah. And he's been dead since uh, about 32. All the people he was there, family doctors mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. Would you please tell us about your diary? This is a list of all the missions we flew, and I don't know why, but when we got back from our first mission, I started writing down about it, and then I wrote down about every mission we flew, the uh, plane we flew on, and the altitude we flew, where we flew, how many bombs we had, anybody got hit or anything in the plane, Possibly how many holes we had after we got back. And, and, and right here now we had 50 P, P uh, 51, that's what was over the target, up to the target, over the plane and the head. And then the one over Budapest. Southeast of that ain't a target not bombed because of the heavy overcast. We had to have visual bombing on some of those targets, and if we couldn't see the target, we didn't get to drop our bombs. We did a jet propelled plane air drone at uh, Munich, dropped 10 500 pound bombs. Motor works at uh, Augsburg. We just hit them all, hit them all bearing and factories and railroad tunnels and bridges and ammunition dumps. Mm -hmm. We went into Yugoslavia and uh, a 
granddaughter's husband was an Italian boy lived in Edna, and we bombed the town where his mom and daddy lived. I felt he was lucky to be alive. Goodness. Did all the refinery. And at the end of the war, he would just fly anywhere over there, and they couldn't come out because they didn't have any fuel. Well, if you could say just one thing to to future generations, what what might that be? Help the ones that over there fight now and try to get it all over. They sure don't want to go. Mm -hmm. My wife, I've been married before. My wife's got a nephew that's a marine, and we've been stationed in Formosa now. In the state, they sent him to Camp Lindenwood, Missouri, to study gas. You know, gas that they shoot out and gas people. And he'd been in Formosa, and they sent him as stopped him as commanding officer back to Fort Lindenwood, Missouri, a couple weeks ago. They've got a new vehicle that they're teaching to them that they can drive out in a field and tell where it's gas. You know. Well, we certainly thank you for sharing your account you. with us. I appreciate it. Very, very much. We're grateful for all you've done for the country and for all of us. There's a B-24 that's still flying. Hold that up. Good. Crew member up in, uh, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, sent this to me. He went down to see it. Mm -hmm. I think it's just one B-24 still flying. Mm -hmm. I had to Hold your picture up, show them which one you are. This one right here, bottom left. We had a good crew. Right. Well, that, that was made up at the church. Well, thank you very, very much. Right. Very interesting. I want to show you. My uniform and all hung in the closet over there for 50 years, I guess. But the grandson took it out Christmas before last and had it all framed in about three and a half by four foot frame. And uh, they had a little World War. I mean, the military used 
them up there, the man who's in charge, you know, they send that picture up at the wall in my office. And he wanted to take it up there, and he said it had more publicity from that than anything up there. Mm -hmm. But he signed it. Lori, have you been back to, have you been to Italy? I have, we go pretty much okay. yearly. How wonderful. Um, sometimes twice a year, and my husband's family was in the area where he was bombing at the time, and so it's very ironic that... <laughs> Why don't you go sit with him and tell us a little bit about that? I'm going to try to get this in the camera. Let me see if I can find the mission page where he actually bombed a bridge where mm -hmm. my husband's family was. And then what the mission number was. Isn't there a bigger picture of what you're looking for? Didn't we have it? I don't know if it was there. It's on the wall right there. Okay, maybe we don't have it, but we'll show it to you. I've been in business 56 years in West Point. Wonderful. In the moving business. The oldest business in West Point still on the bottom of the That's wonderful. I was about 24, I've been retired. I got it. Son -in -law his daughter's secretary. His son helps run it and drives trucks and all. Now, what my grand granddad was talking about, he bombed a bridge near Rubigo, Italy, which is where my husband's family is from. They came over after World War II to Toronto, Canada, and he and I met in Mississippi. And we didn't realize the connection before we started looking at the mission notes. And I found where he had bombed the bridge in Rubigo. And his dad actually knows where the bridge is and thinks he remembers that day that it was bombed. And um, so I'm glad he wasn't on the bridge that day. I may not have my husband. <laughs> right, Granddad? Yeah. Well, then it'd be a hostile in the world. Framed his uniform with his medals and then his crew and swinging and had a big okay and had a big one of it but I don't think we're gonna get this one. Okay, it's a nice deal. Something sitting on the wall up there. And then I got a picture. My granddaughter got a I had a man drew a picture over there sitting on the streets with a a pen. He's drawing pictures, and I walk by, and he said, let me draw your pictures. So I stopped, sit down, and he's drawing, it's really nice. It stayed in a, in a can about so big around, about that long, up to a couple of years ago, and she got out and had it framed with a big yeah, frame. We didn't know it existed. He just got it out a couple of years ago. Wonderful. It is nice. It is. But I'm proud of that. That's, that's nice. Everybody comes in the office and has something to say about it. <laughs> I go down there every day when I don't do anything. And not too, not too long for me to be doing anything. Do you think about your experiences very often in the war? I dream about airplanes you know, once in a while. Just like it's just like it's going on right now. Oh, really? I wake up in the morning and I tell them, well, I fought the war last night. Mm. They, had, they had boys in the, in the, in the same time over in Italy that go crazy. Mm -hmm. I had to lock them up so mm -hmm. they go crazy. But I haven't gotten that far yet. Why do you think it was necessary to fight World War II? Well, we had to stop Hitler somewhere, just like the war now. We got had to stop all that uh, stuff that's going on now. A lot of people don't think so, but I believe if we weren't over there fighting them there, they'd be over here. That's my belief. Yeah. But they, they, if it wasn't for us, it wouldn't be a France. Germany would have had France. And if Germany had had gone and fought Russia, they might have taken over the country. Because they were fighting.
had one or two props and they just couldn't do it. Well, we certainly thank you for all you've done to help keep us protected all these years for your service. Well, thank you very much for coming today.